Most people waste hundreds on a laptop that can't even handle a basic scene in Blender. Why? Because no one tells them what actually matters. Before you buy a laptop for Blender, ask yourself this. Will it actually handle sculpting, rendering and complex scenes? Or will it slow you down and waste your money? In this video, I'll reveal the key specs you need, plus my top laptop picks from 700 to 3000, including one or two you probably haven't considered. Stick around and you'll know exactly what to look for to get the speed, power and portability you need without breaking the bank. Choosing the right laptop can be overwhelming. The technical jargon alone, terms like cores, VRAM, clock speed and SSD can make your head spin. It's enough to make anyone feel lost before they even start shopping. The good news is that you don't need a computer science degree to figure this out. Once you understand the basics and know what features matter most for your 3D work, making the right choice becomes much easier. So, what actually matters for Blender? Let's cut through the jargon and start with the specs that can actually make the biggest difference starting with screen size and resolution. So, manufacturers list laptops by screen size, not their actual width. Screen size refers to the diagonal distance between two opposite corners of the screen and typically ranges between 11 to 17 or 18 inches. So, as a 3D artist, you'll want to aim for 15 to 17 inches. That's the sweet spot for serious viewport work. Go with 14 inches if portability really matters to you, but anything smaller than that will definitely feel too cramped. And honestly, 18 inches is just an overkill in my opinion. Now, screen resolution is just as important as other specifications for 3D work in Blender, and it's pretty obvious because you have three options. 1080p if you're on a budget, 1440p as a solid mid-range option, or 4K for those who want the absolute sharpest detail and the highest pixel density. Keep in mind, Full HD will do the job for most, especially if you're just starting out, but if you want a screen that can show more crisp and detailed textures or animation, 1440p or 4K is the way to go. If you plan on connecting your laptop to an external monitor, it might make more sense to buy a mid-sized laptop that is easier to carry on the go and then spend the extra money you saved by going with the smaller laptop to get a high-end, high-resolution monitor. But no amount of screen resolution will make up for a slow or glitchy laptop when working on complex models or renders. Let's talk about power, specifically the CPU, GPU and RAM. The CPU is essentially the brain of your computer. It handles general calculations and processes required by your software across all applications running on your laptop. Major brands like AMD, Intel and Apple all produce excellent CPUs. For 3D modeling applications like Blender, Maya or Cinema 4D, prioritize two key factors, core count and clock speed, which is measured in gigahertz. The more cores and faster clock speeds, the smoother your workflow will be. Aim for at least six cores with clock speeds of 3.2 gigahertz or higher. Go for something like the AMD Ryzen 5 or 7 processor, but if your projects involve heavy rendering or simulations, consider stepping up to a Ryzen 9. And just a quick tip here, when you're choosing a CPU, don't just chase numbers. A lot of 3D tasks like viewport performance and general modeling rely more on single core speed, while things like rendering lean on multi-core power. So ideally, you want a processor that balances both. Also, Apple's M Pro and Mac's chips shouldn't be overlooked, especially if you're on a Mac workflow. Their efficiency and thermal management are on another level. Now, the GPU is critical for rendering complex scenes and handling textures in Blender. Historically, the GPU industry was dominated by Nvidia and AMD, but now GPUs are evolving, with Apple's integrated M-series chips that combine CPU and GPU into one system on a chip. They are now more than worth mentioning if you are a Mac user, but if you are a Windows or Linux user, then a dedicated GPU is what you need. I would recommend you get NVIDIA GPUs instead of AMD ones. Blender has had the longest and best support for NVIDIA cards, especially the RTX series, which support Q360 
CUDA cores and ray tracing with optics. So look for RTX models with at least 8 to 16 gigabytes of VRAM. But if you're going to be working with high resolution textures, animations or create complex scenes, then a bit more will be required. This will definitely depend on your budget, but 24 to 36 gigabytes will be amazing. Now here's something worth knowing, Blender's support for NVIDIA through CUDA and Optics has made RTX cards the go-to for years. AMD is catching up with their HIP API, which is an equivalent to NVIDIA's CUDA and is supported on Windows and Linux and requires an AMD graphics card with the RDNA 1 architecture or newer. Supported GPUs include the Radeon RX 5000, 6000, 7000, 9000 and the Radeon Pro W6000 and 7000 series. While Intel's ARC GPUs are trying to enter the space, they're not reliable enough yet for production work. As for Apple's M series chips, they handle moderate projects just fine and their metal integration keeps improving. But for heavy GPU based rendering, dedicated Nvidia hardware still gives you the edge. The good thing about Blender is that you can always check on their open data page which GPUs and CPUs perform the best, so you can make a better informed decision before you start buying anything you might regret, or just in case I got anything wrong. That said, please do let me know if have any outdated information or got anything wrong. Blender is constantly updating and your polite feedback would really be helpful. Now. Before we continue, let me quickly introduce you to an add-on that might improve your workflow in Blender. If you've ever tried making a forest in Blender, you know how time-consuming and repetitive it can get. Trees often look identical, and adding natural variety is a real challenge. Tree Machine solves these problems instantly by giving you access to six tree species, each with multiple size variations and infinite randomization. You can control everything from branch direction to wind animation, all in just a few clicks. If you want to save time and keep your workflow smooth and get natural and realistic results every time, the tree machine might be exactly what you're looking for. Use the code CGFOCUS at checkout to get a 10% discount. Link in the description. Now, the RAM is where your laptop temporarily stores data while working on files. It's essential for multitasking during large projects. For basic 3D modeling tasks, you want to aim for at least 16 gigabytes of RAM. And for tasks that require high resolution or simulations, you want to go for something like 32 gigabytes or more. Some tasks like fluid sims, smoke sims, or working with large textures can eat RAM fast. If you've ever had your system crash mid-bake, you already know what I'm talking about. So 32 gigabytes isn't overkill. It's actually a sweet spot for most production work. And if you're going DDR5, even better, it offers faster bandwidth, which helps with multitasking and caching. And Apple machines require you to decide on RAM upfront since they cannot be upgraded later, which is a downside compared to many Windows-based laptops that allow post-purchase upgrades. So you want to get at least 16 gigabytes to 36 gigabytes of unified memory. With Apple's unified memory, it's shared between the CPU and GPU, which is great for speed, but again, not upgradable. So if you're planning to do anything long term on a MacBook, don't cheap out on RAM. You only get one shot at configuring it right. Now for storage, definitely opt for an SSD because SSDs offer faster boot times and smoother application loading. But the amount of space will always come down to personal preference depending on what you will be using it for. But I would say you don't need anything lower than 512 gigabytes of storage. The good thing is that you can always get yourself external drives if you require the extra storage. Just make sure you're getting a proper NVMe SSD if possible. For external drives, go with USB-C Gen 2 or even Thunderbolt if you're on a Mac. You'll notice the speed difference instantly when dragging huge project files or opening blend files with packed assets. When it comes to battery life, most Windows laptops have terrible battery life but Apple laptops generally outperform PCs in battery efficiency, so I can't really recommend you something here. It will all come down to doing your own research, but always check specifications of the laptop or user reviews for realistic battery expectations under heavy workloads if there are any. 
That being said, some of the newer Windows laptops, especially those with AMD Ryzen 7 chips or Intel Evo, have decent battery life too. But once you fire up Blender or start rendering, most laptop batteries take a hit. So always check battery benchmarks under real creative workloads. Now, the part you all have been waiting for. So I've spent hours and days researching, comparing, and I've finally narrowed down my absolute best laptops for Blender, covering every budget from $700 to $3,000. But before we start, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And in case you want to check out these laptops or learn certain areas in Blender, make sure to use my affiliate links in the description. You don't pay anything extra, but I get a small commission from every sale. So it's a great way to support the channel. Now, let's kick things off with the high-end options. The ones built for serious power users, large scale projects, and anyone who needs zero compromise in their Blender workflows. First up, the 14 and 16 inch MacBook Pros. If you're deep in the Apple ecosystem or just want a machine that's fast, quiet, and super efficient, this one's hard to beat. You can get up to 128 gigabytes of unified memory paired with up to a 16 core CPU, a 40 core GPU, and Apple's 16 core neural engine. Storage goes all the way up to eight terabytes. And of course, you're getting that stunning Liquid Retina XDR display, which is perfect for color accurate work and cinematic lighting. The price? It starts from around $2,500, but as always with Apple, configure it right from the start because you can't upgrade it later. Next, we have the Legion 9i. This thing is a powerhouse. It's equipped with a 14th generation Intel Core i9 processor with speeds up to 5.80 gigahertz, 24 cores and 32 threads. That's serious multi-core muscle right there. For graphics, you're getting an Nvidia GeForce RTX 4090 with 16 gigabytes of VRAM. Great for heavy simulations, GPU rendering and large texture workflows. It's upgradable up to 64 gigabytes of DDR5 memory, and the storage goes up to two terabytes of PCIe Gen 4. The screen is a 3.2K mini LED display with a smooth 165 Hertz refresh rate. And the price? It starts from around the $2,050, which is a steal for this much power. Now let's talk about the Razer Blade 14 and 16. If you want extreme performance in a sleek, minimal design, this one hits the mark. It comes with a 13th generation Intel Core i9 processor, clocking up to 5.5 GHz and offers up to 24 cores and 32 threads. For graphics, it's packed with the NVIDIA GeForce RTX 5090, up to 24 GB of VRAM. You also can get it up to 64 gigabytes of RAM and up to four terabytes of storage using dual M.2 PCIe drives. The screen is a bright 4K display. Prices start from around $2,400. It's premium, portable, and built for creators and gamers, of course. Now the Asus ROG Zephyrus G14 and G16 is one of my favorites. This one is like a MacBook alternative for PC. It's great if you want something slim, lightweight and portable, but still Blender ready. It runs on Intel's Core Ultra 9 chip with speeds up to 5.4 gigahertz and comes with 16 cores and 16 threads. Graphics wise, it features the Nvidia GeForce RTX 5060 with eight gigabytes of VRAM. You can get up to 32 gigabytes of RAM and two terabytes of storage using a fast M.2 PCIe drive. The screen is a beautiful OLED display. It's sharp, vibrant, and excellent for 3D work. It starts at around the $2,800. Now let's move on to mid-range laptops. These are great if you're balancing performance and budget at the same time. Perfect for Blender users who need solid rendering power, but don't need to go all in on premium specs. First up is the Omen 16. It comes with Intel's Core Ultra 5 processor with speeds up to 4.9 gigahertz, 14 cores and 14 threads. For graphics, it's running Nvidia's RTX 4050 with six gigabytes of VRAM. 
you can upgrade it with up to 32 gigabytes of DDR5 memory and up to a terabyte SSD. The screen is a 2.5K IPS panel with anti-glare and low blue light protection. The price? It starts from around $1420. Next up is the Predator Helios Neo 16. It comes with a 14th generation Intel Core i9 chip running up to 5.8 gigahertz with 24 cores. Graphics wise, you get it up to an RTX 4070 with eight gigabytes of VRAM, and it comes with 16 gigabytes of DDR5 memory and a one terabyte SSD. The display is a crisp 2.5K panel and starts at just $1,150, making it a serious value for the power. Then there's the MSI Creator 16. Built with creators in mind, it runs on Intel's Ultra 9 chip, clocking up to five gigahertz with 24 cores. The GPU is an NVIDIA GeForce RTX 4080 with 12 gigabytes of VRAM. You can max it up to 96 gigabytes of RAM and a 1TB SSD. The display is a gorgeous 4K mini LED display, perfect for color work and detailed scenes in Blender. Pricing starts from around $1500. Next is the Asus ROG Strix G16. This one features Intel's Core i9 chip, up to 5.6 GHz with 24 cores and 34 threads. For graphics, you're looking at a 48 with 8GB of VRAM. It starts with 8GB of RAM. But it's also upgradable with a 1TB SSD, which is also upgradable. The screen is a sharp 16-inch 2K panel and starts at around $1,800. Now, let's look into the budget tier. These laptops will still very much get the job done in Blender, especially if you're just starting out or working on light to medium-sized projects. First up is the HP Victus 15, which comes with an Intel Core i5 processor, up to 4.6 gigahertz, eight cores, and 12 threads. The graphics card is in 4050 with six gigabytes of VRAM. You also get 16 gigabytes of RAM and a one terabyte SSD. The screen is a full HD panel and it starts at just $750. Next up is the MSI GF63 Fin, a lightweight option with an Intel Core i7 processor that goes up to 4.9 gigahertz. For graphics, it comes with an RTX 4050 with 6 gigabytes of VRAM. It supports up to 64 gigabytes of RAM and has a 512 gigabyte SSD. The screen is a full HD panel and starts from around $700. $190. Then there's the Dell G15. This one is a beast. It can be specced with Intel's Core i9 processor and an RTX 4070 with 8GB of VRAM. The memory is expandable up to 64GB and you can add up to 4TB of storage. The screen is a 2K display, nice and sharp. And the price? It starts from around $990. And finally, the Acer Nitro 5, a solid budget-friendly machine with an Intel Core i7 processor with 14 cores and 20 threads. The graphics goes up to an RTX 4060 with 8 gigabytes of VRAM, 32 gigabytes of RAM, and a 1TB SSD. The display is a 2K panel, starting at around $780. So there you have it, my top laptop picks from $700 to $3000, covering the top high-end laptops for Blender, for those who need nothing but the best. Then a few mid-range options, powerful enough for most Blender workflows without burning a hole in your wallet. And finally, budget options that can still handle serious 3D work in Blender, even on a tight budget. So, I hope I helped you narrow things down for your next Blender laptop and answer the question whether your laptop can actually run Blender the way it's intended to. Anyways, don't forget to leave a comment sharing which laptop you currently use, how it's been for you, or which laptop you're leaning towards now. And if there's a model you think I should have included, mention it that would really be helpful. But if you want to build a PC for Blender instead, check out this video. And with that said, thank you so much for watching this video. And as always, I'll catch you in the next one.